First and foremost, I was a college athlete. I ran at the University of Houston and in uh, track and field was coached by Tom Telev and later by Leroy Burrell. But despite coming from a two-parent home, K-12 educators, right? I graduated in the top 5% of my class. I, too, had challenges. I had challenges. We've heard some phenomenal presentations um, yesterday that talked about many of the challenges that black male athletes go through. But we, too, as black females, had some challenges as well. And, and where do we come into play when we talk about the relationship uh, or our connection, if you will, to these black male athletes? And it's one where I want to say we do have relationships with these black male athletes. I had a brother that ran at the University of Florida. My husband, I didn't know him then, um, but he was a college athlete at LSU, later to become a world champion and an Olympian as well, but he was also from another country. So he had a black experience, but it was a black Caribbean experience in the US. And then just nine weeks ago, I gave birth to a little boy. So when we talk about this notion of relationships, that black female athlete could be your sister. Well, and eventually may be your wife. And as we've heard a couple of presentations mention, Dr. Baker, yes, I'm speaking into existence, talked about the role of parents. Dr. Anderson talked about the role of family obligation. And Dr. Williams, Ricky, right? He wanted to be called Dr. Williams, right? <laughs> talked about the role of his mother in nurturing his upbringing and eventual success in athletics. So I have a quote here. It just came out of er uh, Oglesby's book. The black sportswoman is unknown and, of course, unheralded. This is a tragic loss for the American community, black and white male and female, for many reasons. Not the least among the reasons is the fact that the black American sportswoman has performed a prodigious psychological achievement, the understanding of which can be beneficial to all. To become a fine athlete, she has to develop an assessment of herself in the face of society, which devalued her as both female and black. I want you to marinate with that a little bit. How do I cope? How do I reconcile with the reality that I'm a member of an elite privileged group as a student athlete, while simultaneously walking around campus, seeing very few people that look like me, going to the class where there's only one other person and one other black student who may not be an athlete? The only black female with no interaction beyond the track, beyond the court, beyond the classroom. We too had challenges. We too have gone through some things. So not only my presentation, but the phenomenal scholars that are coming behind me will also speak of some of these challenge, challenges further. Again, remember in our history, remember the legacy led uh, by Althea Gibson and what she was able to overcome and succeed. But it wasn't easy. Looking at the experience of the Tennessee Tiger Bells, and I think this is important here, and I want to highlight this, these women, this legacy of the Tiger Bells, how they nurtured one another going through these challenges, going through the challenges within and of themselves, but also with their brothers. So when we look at the contemporary research on black female college athletes, it's few and far between. But some of the issues that they deal with were also mentioned yesterday. Marginalized treatment, okay, feeling devalued, being silenced, right? Academic challenges, believe it or not they still face, identity development and negotiation, because I too was entrenched in this I'm an athlete identity. 
I'm still an athlete. I, I got a little bit of it. A little bit out of shape, but we're going to work it out. But through this, it was also a need for a mentor, a need for somebody that looks like me, a need for somebody to guide me through that pathway. And then how do we deal with that? Understanding the coping strategies that they use. Because the ways in which black males deal with their challenges is vastly different from the way that the women look at it. We've been, we've been trained, right? We've been schooled while we're getting our hair braided by our mothers to be strong, to work through the pain, to endure it. And I think this quote by Wilma Rudolph, even though I know that within this, she was really kind of talking about track and field, but I think within this quote, it's a bigger message. Winning is great, sure, but if you're really gonna do something in life, the secret is learning how to lose. Nobody goes, goes undefeated all the time. If you can pick up after a crushing defeat, and go on to win again, you're going to be a champion someday. There's going to be challenges. You're going to fall down, but you got to get up. We've heard that message. Our mothers preach it. Our fathers preach it. But it's not our mothers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, our other mothers, and I'll talk a little bit about who those people are. Talk about those particular challenges. So when we look at the contemporary development of black female athletes, it's one of those in which we need to understand from their challenges and the things that they deal with, what's going on. Up here when we talk about you know, white females' historical sports journey, it's a little bit different. But the black woman, the legacy of those Tiger Bells, we were supported by the black community. We were supported by our brothers, our fathers, our uncles. We could be that sportswoman. We could be all of that and still have that respect. We can be that sportswoman. We can work in that house. We can be a diva, right? But we can still be revered. But we have to understand that we're socialized, too, into many of these behaviors. This talks about here socialization, participation of newcomers for life in the social, economic, physical, cultural, and extra physical surroundings. But like I said, we learn from the people that raised us how to be and how to be strong. From my identity standpoint, we've had a lot of conversation about that as well. Where are they? This notion of identity foreclosure. Many of us that competed, and I'm talking about black women, athletes that competed, we have that strong, just a strong athletic identity as these black males. We see ourselves fully ingrained in this. But some of the challenges and some of the differences in that is that we don't have those opportunities post-college like the black male. So we reach that reality a little sooner. Then we gotta switch it up. We gotta focus on education. We gotta get a job. And while I didn't even know it when I was being raised, my father was giving me some, some tutelage as well. He's like, you know, you gotta, gotta learn. I'm out here changing the tire. I'm changing the tire. I guess somebody do that for me, you know. But it was one of those things is that he wanted me to learn to be independent. And unfortunately, I think some of that thinking was not only be independent, but you may be by yourself. You may be alone. You may be that single mother one day. And I want to make sure that you're able to take care of yourself and don't want anything from a man necessarily and can do it yourself. So we grow up with a strong mentality, this independent mentality, but this mentality too that we've got to deal with things and just move through. And that's a legacy that black women not only in sports have dealt with, but just in, in general. So when we look at these notions of social development, right, identity development, and we bring it to the college age, what they talk about is that in order to foster a college student's development, they need to focus on programs that will instill this notion of cognitive development, okay? How a person learns. There's many methods and moral development models, Kohlberg, right? We need to focus on their psychosocial development, determining self-concept, 
establishing lifelong goals. There's models established with that as well. But these are heavily rooted in a white male frame. They are absent of this cultural reality, this cultural legacy that we've been born into. So we think about the college experience, pushing these other psychosocial cognitive development issues, right? But then NCAA comes. How do they play a role? How does the athletic department play a role in the social development of young men and women? Well, the NCAA a few years ago thought about this would be a great idea because we do need to sort of work with the holistic development in order to sort of to justify their ability to take care, right? Take care of the student athlete. We need to focus on some other areas. So they developed the Champs Life Skills Program, focusing on academic excellence, athletic excellence, personal development, all of those wonderful things, career development, resume building. You've heard it. Community service. Let's get their faces out there. Let them do something. But much like these developmental theories from a college student development standpoint, Champs Life Skills also lacks the cultural aspect. So where do our young black men and young black women learn about themselves? Who are they learning from? How do they know what it means to be more than an athlete? How do they know what it means to be a young black male in our society, a young black female in society? Unfortunately, we have been blessed by basketball wives, <laughs> hip hop wives, the real housewives of Atlanta, Oh yeah, <laughs> Ms. Nene Lee. That's the story that they know. And you know when this really hit me is when I went to Grenada where my husband is from. And the way I was received in Grenada was quite different because who was he marrying an American black woman? But then I look on TV and I'm like, we got Real Housewives on the TV, no wonder. They think I'm a real housewife, carting 40 pairs of shoes over here, you know, interested in labels, weave all down my back. That's not who I am, okay? But that's what the public knows about us. That's what the media portrays. And unfortunately, that's what our young women are learning from. So, I was thinking, how can we begin to work with these young men and women, okay, young women in particular, to really hone in on their development, to bring that cultural component in? Well, there's some things out there. There's the Afrocentric paradigm. Okay? And we hear a lot of this by Karenga, right? And it's the notion of that we need to focus on diversity, okay? Racial diversity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and how it was rooted and ingrained and brought from these African principles okay, that we still model, if you will. So McEwen, Roper, Bryan, and Langa, they developed this task, these nine developmental task factors for the African American student athlete. Programs have been built around this, okay? a rites of passage, if you will. So some of the things that they focus on are developing ethnic and racial identity. Okay? So addressing thoughts and concerns regarding ethnic and racial identity in an effort to develop skills to protect oneself, right? Interacting with the dominant culture. Because many of these young black student athletes, male and female, are coming from environments, are coming from neighborhoods, are coming from cultures that are ingrained, right, in the black community. And then you're just put into a white environment and expected to thrive. How do you do that when you're away from home? Because most of these D1 universities are where? Austin, Texas, okay, is a city. Texas A&M College Town. Brother went to University of Florida, Gainesville, Florida. Small towns, 
very few African Americans around, so what do you do? How do you develop? So this was a good way of go, this is a good way of thinking when we talk about the development of the black student athlete, but what does it mean when we talk about the black female student athlete? This notion, this notion of this Afrocentric paradigm is great, but it's still rooted and designed for black men. This notion of a rites of passage. So what do I say? When I came to Texas A&M University, upon my first couple of weeks there, actually first week, orientation, someone from the athletic department came and found me, said, we've been looking for you. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and what do you want? We've been looking for you. I heard you are coming to this university. We're recruiting an athlete. We need you. Those of us that are black professors out there, we know that story. We need you to help us recruit this athlete. And then it turned into, we need you to help us recruit, to I need you to help me mentor. So I got one mentee, and then I got five, and then I got 10, and then I got like 25, and I'm like, okay, I'm trying to keep my job because y'all not paying me, right? So I wanted to come up with a way that we can, that I can still give, right, without losing myself. So from this notion of this Afrocentric feminist epistemology by Patricia Hill Collins, the notion that we can speak to issues of the lived experience, okay? To use dialogues, use voice, we need to talk with these young women in some way, shape, or form. They need to be heard, because we've been historically silenced and we've been invisible, okay? This notion of ethic of caring and also this ethic of personal accountability. These are some of the things and the principles that we need to teach these young women. Well, this is a great idea. And ideally, the, the main thing that we would like to do was, okay, let's, when we talked about this lived experience of the criterion, what does that mean? They need mentors. Yes, and I was one of those. But that reality is why I got that one, that five, that 25 young women. If we start looking at some of the statistics, because if we look at the statistics and look at the percentages of where black women are on predominantly white campuses, I pulled up some statistics here, instructor and faculty, black men and women comprise 6% on these campuses. When we look at the coaching, 10% head coaches are black, are black women in basketball, 24.9% are assistant coaches, track and field 6.3%, 8%. So it's one of those things we have to notice, so this is a great idea in theory. Here's some if we look at the, uh, the support staff of athletics. So this is a great idea in theory, but in reality, black women aren't there. So who do these young women look to? They look to media, Danini, if you will, to learn how to be a black woman. But they're also talking to one another. And I don't know if you remember when you were 18 and 19. We didn't always have the best advice for one another. <laughs> So they're talking to one another. So another way I thought about it is here was what we can do. Promote this notion of ethic of caring. And what does that essentially consist of? This notion of ethic of caring is something which Collins talks about is that we as black women have a need to nurture one another, to be that other mother. So while my mom was not there, there may have been an aunt or uncle in town, a big sister, an older woman on the team, right? somebody from the church that can help us. But it's that notion that we have a need to care about other children and other people's children. So in this way, in this capacity, this is what I work from in developing the Sister to Sister program with my colleague Denise Dorch, who's now at the University of Wisconsin working on her PhD. But this notion of ethic of caring focuses on personal expressiveness, emotions, and empathy. And so we work with these young women once a month. It's come as you are, come if you can, because we know the, the necessities of athletics and what you need for your time, right? And some of the challenges of that. But it's one where we allow these young women to come and share their story in a safe space, to speak freely without being judged, and to share some of those challenges they have but not only share, but we also help educate them on how to share effectively, 
on how to be a sister. Because unfortunately, I think we've gotten away from the notion of Tennessee Tiger Bells, where I'm my sister's keeper. And it's this kind of cat fight, and we're pulling each other down, fighting for each other's man. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I lived it. I know it. I've seen it. It's rough. <laughs> but teaching them how to engage in positive relationships with other black women, giving them a space where they can be valued, letting them know that we care. This is one way that I've done it. But it's one of those things of how do we continue to promote this, understanding the parameters that we're up against in a predominantly white institution. There's a need for what some may have heard of culturally responsive practitioners. Practitioners that are able to understand the challenges, the experiences, the history of the black athlete. So what does this mean for our practitioners? One, if they understand our story and how we developed and how we are molded. And for these young people to learn from someone who's older than them, that, or that may be in that position, to know that we expect academic achievement from you. We expect athletic achievement from you. But not only that, we expect personal achievement from you. They need to know what's going on. They need to be ingrained with our culture. Right? be culturally competent, and to be able to challenge the stereotypes that are out there and help the young women challenge the basketball wife stereotype, okay? the housewife stereotype, and begin to question, why do they put us in this frame? Why are we only seen this way? Because as we know, and as the literature says, we are not a monolithic culture. right? The next thing I'll say is, yes, you can develop these such programs in your environment, but also to be mindful of the surrounding community. We know we're limited. We know we don't have many people around us, but we do have the black church, which are still in these communities. Use those people. You've got a few sprinkles of black women faculty on staff. Use those people. You've got the 100 black women the NAACP and our sororities on campus as well that can be utilized to help other mother these young women. Well, you may say, well, I'm not black. That's one of the questions I got when I gave this presentation before. I'm not black, I'm not gonna understand. Or I'm not a black female, as some of our black males may say. Well, what do you need to do then? Here's some practical news. Hire us, hire black women. Not only hire us, but retain us at your institution. Collaborate with faculty and staff, black women and faculty and staff, so they can help their program. And finally, I'll say this, listen. Listen to the cries of these young women. And then seek to understand what they're going through. I'm gonna end with this quote so I can let my other prisoners go. But Althea Gibson said these words. I always wanted to be somebody. If I made it, it's half because I was game enough to take a lot of the punishment along the way, and half because there were a lot of people, there were a lot of people who cared enough to help me. So I'll end with that, but remind you that I'm from this institution of college athletics, but these were my sisters. These are women at University of Houston that I went to school with, that as soon as I walked through the door, rang their keys, and they're like, you're with me. I'm gonna take care of you. And they helped me get through this process. I don't see that today. This needs to come back. The Tiger Bell legacy needs to come back. Why? Because again, we're sisters, we're going to be potential wives, 
And some of us are going to be mothers of these other young women that are coming through. That's my time. And I'll let the, my other young colleagues begin to start addressing the notion of what it means to be a black woman through their stories, um, through their personal uh, experiences, and go from there.